My name is Aria Pon, um, Ari for short. Um, and my mom renamed me, I asked her to, because it was very important for me to remain connected with my family, and to remain connected with my mom. <laughs> Aria Pon means the blessing of radiant light or the power of radiant light. Which definition did you pick? The meaning that she would have spelt it was the blessing of radiant light. Um, and the, the spelling that I chose translates um, Aria Pon to the power of radiating light. Power. <laughs> Honolulu fashion designer Arya Pon Suthipong, formerly the man known as Andy South. Next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Aria Pon Suthipong is one of Hawaii's most recognized young fashion designers. Name doesn't ring a bell? You may know her better as Andy South. In 2010, Andy South was a top three finalist on Lifetime Television's fashion reality show, Project Runway. In 2012, a year before our conversation, Andy changed his name to Ari and began his transition to becoming a female. A child of Laotian immigrants, Ari, then Andy, grew up far from the glamour of fashion and television. Born in Kailua on Oahu's windward coast, Andy lived with his parents, his sister, half-sister, and two half-brothers. Andy's parents had a tumultuous marriage. By the time Andy reached the third grade, his parents had split, his mother remarried, and the family moved to the other side of Oahu, to Waianae. And what prompted the move to Waianae? Farming. <laughs> what kind of farming? Um, catfish farming. Um, catfish um, and sunfish, which is... Um, tilapia, uh, right? Tilapia. <laughs> it's a fancy word for tilapia. But yeah, so freshwater um, sunfish, freshwater uh, Chinese catfish. When we first started, we actually did an um, above-ground tank in our backyard in Kailua, and it leaked into the neighbor's yard. It was a huge ordeal with us running into a lot of issues with, you know, it was our, also our test period, right, of trying to farm, um, you know, raise fish and see if it would, it would be viable for us to actually do it as a business. So, um, yeah, we eventually moved out to Waianae, um, and I lived there most of my life, actually. What brought your parents to Hawaii? A better future, you know, quintessential immigrant parents. Um, but more so in my mom's case, it was specifically, um, she had actually come here with her first husband, who is um, the father to my three eldest siblings, who are half-siblings for me. But they came as college students, and it was also, um, it was also to escape communism. Um, my mother, youngest of five girls, um, daughter to a governor. So when the whole government was overturned, they were actually warned to leave the country, or they would have eventually been killed if they were ever caught. So that was um, their, their reason for leaving. Is there an exciting escape story? No. <laughs> college. <laughs> so they did Visa. Family. Yeah, college visas. And at, at the time, they were actually coming back and forth to Hawaii for college at the University of Hawaii. And it just so happened that the, you know, things were, the government weren't going well. And so they just eventually, my mom based herself here. And slowly, everybody was sent over, starting with the kids. So all of my you know, 20 plus cousins have gone through my mom's household. Um, when they were, you know, in their teens, going through um, high school, starting college, and then their parents made their way over. So, so your mom was a privileged daughter of a governor mm -hmm. to a struggling catfish farmer yeah. in Waianae. Yeah, basically. Yeah, my mom would talk a lot about her growing up in Laos and a lot of the things that she, I guess, throughout our our lives, you know, growing up um, as farmers, she would reminisce sometimes about the easier times when, you know, she. Life wasn't so hard. She basically. she had somebody tending yeah, to her all exactly. day. Exactly. Yeah. So, but I love I love when people reminisce. I love old stories. I love speaking to older people. I just think that life is so interesting that way. That the stories are all different, and and then you realize it's how they have come out of situations or how they um, turn situations to to benefit from and to turn them into blessings as opposed to letting it kill them. So you've always kind of been attuned to coping skills? Yes, I think so. And resilience? Um, mm -hmm. And I learned that all from my mom, you know, and my mom still is the the hero that I have, which is I think everybody, a lot of people can say that their mother is their hero or their father is a hero. I think for every child it's very deep for different reasons and 
Um, for me, it's because I've watched my mom be the strong woman that she is, um, and I've seen her in her weak moments, you know, but even in that, she had shown such great strength by not letting it show. Growing up as a boy known then as Andy Suthipong, Andy found his mother's lesson of resilience to be a valuable and recurring one, as childhood teasing led to bigger questions. Do you remember some of the early um, things that you had to use resilience to overcome when you were a kid? <laughs> um, a lot of teasing. You know, About not, what? What kind I of mean, teasing? Regular not, kind? Yeah, I think a lot of regular teasing with just kids being kids. Um, I obviously wasn't the, the popular kid growing up. I wasn't athletic. I was actually a lot heavier when I was a child. So I was teased a lot for, one, my weight, for me being just naturally effeminate as a boy. Did that bother you? It did, but I never let it get me down because I think I've, I've been fortunate to have a lot of mentors throughout my life, and they've been my teachers, a lot of my instructors. What did the teachers say, or how did they how do they uh, let you know everything was okay? I guess it was it was the positive feedback that I was getting from them for my work and for me being a good student, for them constantly telling me, you're going to go far, you know, mm -hmm. even at, in elementary. That matters so much to the development of a child because had they not been that positive with me, and I don't think they ever knew that I, you know, would, be, would, would get teased or that it bothered me. or I was never bullied, per se. I never was picked on, but, you know, you have other students in your class of how many really rowdy boys and you don't fit in with the boys and then if you play with the girls that's more reason for you to get teased. Did right? you try to sound less effeminate? I th Growing up I did you know mm -hmm. throughout high school it started to matter more as I grew older and as I reached um, high school because that I guess is you start to really decide who you are and or it's decided for you. Yeah, or it's, you know, yeah, it's decided for you based on the opinions of your peers. And I tried to, you know, I took a weightlifting class as an elective. I don't think I'm the prep person to go to weightlifting, you know. And, and did you talk roughly? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure I, yeah, there were, there were a lot of moments that I tried to, especially like, you know, locker room situations were awkward because a lot of people just gathered and assumed that I was gay, you know, and they would, they would voice that. And. And so from early on, I would, you know, that's when I was like, okay, maybe I am, you know. And did you, yeah, did you know you were gay? I did. Um, well, I knew that I wasn't straight. That's a thing, you know, and I, the closest thing that I knew of to what I really am was being gay. Um, but you didn't think that quite hit it? No, never. Uh -huh. um, that's a thing. And maybe that was the reason. I, that was probably the reason why I never fully accepted it until, I didn't come out to my mom till I was 21. Among my gay friends, you know, my other gay male friends, I never felt like I, I still didn't fit in, you know? Something internally just wasn't right. After high school and college, um, I actually met more of, I met more gay friends, you know, going out to the clubs more, meeting more of the community that I started to meet transgender women, transgender men, drag queens or cross-dressers that I started to realize that there's much more to the community than just being gay or straight or bisexual, gay or straight. And I started to open my eyes because then I started to get to know them. I started to get to know people for who they are. You know, that's never something that I allowed myself to do before because I was so focused on school, focused on um, my career, you know, and I, that's, that's how I am. You know, when, I've, when I was in college, Everything was school, school, school. It was, you know, I was sewing all the time. I was doing extra projects because that was my focus. Um, and it could have been a distraction. That's what I was going to ask yeah. you. Do you think you <laughs> did that as an escape from questions about identity, mm -hmm. which are central to any young person? Mm -hmm. It's who, who are you? What yeah. am I evolving into? Exactly. Who will I be? Who am I now? Yeah. Well, because I knew that I had a talent that was received positively. So I think that's why I was always drawing. I was always creating. In high school, I was always I always loved the big projects, the the projects that every other kid hated. I loved building. You know, we had to like do build these in, huge insects at one point. We had to make cell models, and I loved. It. I spent all my money and all my allowance at craft supply stores, mm -hmm. and on the weekends and on the um, school breaks, I would stay home and watch like home and garden television, and you know all these craft shows that I loved, and I you know I started dabbling in quilting, and my mom taught me needlepoint when I was. Uh, very young, so that's where I get a lot of my initial sewing skills from. 
but that was my way of putting my best forward because I knew that that was something that was very positive. And were me. you th consciously thinking, I'm not going to, there, there's other things I have to pursue, but I just can't get to that right now. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is, yeah. but something's up with me. Yeah, always. That's always been in the back of my mind. The former man known as Andy Suthipong set aside questions about identity and instead focused on finding a career that would play to his creative strengths. During his senior year at YNI High School, Andy fell in love with a career option he had not previously considered. All those career days and nobody mentioned fashion? No, no, not at all, not in YNI, you know, and um, it wasn't until I went to a state college fair at the Blaisdell, I found a connection with being creative and um, seeing what you create being taken to a commercial sense, you know, and being sold and being worn and actually being utilized every day, you know, for, for art to have a purpose was really, that was really, really um, interesting to me, you know, to see something that you create become something functional in the real world. And so what, after that, that college fair, I decided that I wanted to do fashion. And I just found like, it just was, that's why I say it was serendipitous because had I not gone to that fashion, up to that, that career fair, I wouldn't have realized that it was possible. What were you looking for at the career fair? Did you have something I think in mind? I, I, at the time, I was in culinary arts. Uh -huh. um, and before that, it was um, architecture and mechanical drawing. And I had taken classes in, in both, you know, throughout high school as electives. And that's because I loved, you know, I loved uh, being in the home. I loved to cook. I loved to, you know, do crafts with my mom. And so I was trying to find something that was something that I loved. You know, you, you're told that you should do... Yeah, build on what you know, Yeah, right? build on what you know, build on... Choose to do something that you love so that you're happy. Not long after that serendipitous discovery, Andy Suthipong branded himself as Andy South and enrolled in the fashion technology program at Honolulu Community College. He gained a reputation for designing edgy couture gowns. Several years after graduating, serendipity found Andy once more. I think you were only 23 when you got yourself on Project Runway. Yes. How did that happen? I went through an audition process and I had gotten a call while I was at work and um, it was a casting agent for Project Runway who had gotten my number from someone else and they said that, you know, we got, um, we called a few people locally in the area and they all had you at, their top of the, at the top of their list to contact to audition. So they invited me to audition. And even then, it was maybe a week before the deadline. And I was like, I don't know. And at the time, I had already looked into the audition process. I looked at the deadline. Was it a lot to do? Did you have to make something? It was, it was a lot of prep, you know, because you'd have to submit a portfolio, a digital portfolio. You'd have to do a three to five minute, um, you know, audition video, fill out the application, which I believe was 20 some odd pages, mm. a lot. Um, and that was like written pages. And then there was another 40 of what you had to read for the contract. So um, it was a very, it was a daunting process that I was just kind of like, eh, I kind of wrote it off as like, oh, I'll try next year, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, but by them giving me the, by calling me, I said, you know, what's the worst that can happen? You know, I'll just continue doing what I'm doing. I'll stay up late a few nights yeah. and get it done. Yeah, you know, and mm. so a lot of things happened just in that instant because I knew that I listened to what I was supposed to do. I could tell that God, was telling me, you need to do this because you're getting too comfortable. Because at the time, I was working for another company locally, um, another fashion brand, but she was more focused on manufacturing and selling. So not as creative. Um, I was doing a lot of office administration stuff and shipping orders, taking orders, but really learning the business. So mm -hmm. that's really where I learned a lot of what I need to put into practice. And by now. this time, you're out of Honolulu Community yeah. College's mm -hmm. fashion program. Mm -hmm. I was already talking to the owner of the company about taking over, you know, taking over the company so she can retire. Um, and I would have been set, you know, I would be running another company, but it wouldn't be the company I'm running now. And so the fact that I acted on that, um, that, gut re that gut instinct that told me, okay, you need to do this. You don't know what's gonna happen, but you need to do it and just be open to the possibilities. Um, and that was me listening to what I was supposed to do. The things playing out the way that they did, that. Um, you know, told me, okay, you're about to embark on a really crazy ride and you better free yourself up and be open to what's gonna come. 
And, and you acquitted yourself in the way your mom said you should with strength of character. Right. Was that hard to do? I mean, it must have been tempting sometimes not to make a snarky comment, as, <laughs> as everyone else seemed to right. be. Right. That would have been the easy thing to do. But I think I kept in mind that you're always on camera. You're always on a microphone. So and even if you said something in private, they would ask you about it later. So. And it'll exist on tape forever yeah. or mm -hmm. digital records. Yeah, exactly. So I always kept that in mind, which kept me from overreacting. But I think, you know, after I grew out of my childhood tantrums and the, as I matured, um, I grew calmer in my thoughts. You know, I was, my friends always tell me that I have a really calm demeanor about myself, that even in the thick of stress, in the thick of um, chaotic situations, um, I'm able to think logically and to be level-headed about my reactions. And, you know, there are times when I'm running around the, the studio crazy and I'm telling people to do 10 things at one time and I'm yelling at people, but um, most times I'm very, you know, I'm actually much more thoughtful about my actions and um, that has that helped me, you know, that and also um, making sure that I had, um, many people don't know this, um, but how important my faith is to me. You know, I think the more I talk about it, I think that you can, you hear it, that it, it plays a huge role of my day to day, even though I don't talk about it and I don't, you know, you know, make it an evangelistical thing. But I kept my Bible with me um, and I prayed every night and I just wanted to keep myself centered, keep myself grounded because I knew that I was entering uh, a place that I wasn't familiar with and I didn't want to be, um, you know, just caught off guard and not lose myself. I didn't want to lose myself in it. Rather, Andy Suthipong, a.k.a. Andy South, was finding himself. At the brink of his fashion design success in Hawaii and on Project Runway, Andy was beginning to resolve those questions about his identity that he had long kept in the back of his mind. When did you discover transgendered living? Well, my first time doing drag was probably, you know, years into going out in the gay scene. And I kind of, you know, it's not one of those things that like have, had tormented me my whole life. Like I just knew that something wasn't, wasn't completely there, but I never, it was never like pressing on my mind all the time. So um, I just decided, I mean, I tried to, I decided to do drag one year um, in Portland. Was that because you're fas a fashion conscious person or because um, you thought maybe you'd like to be a woman? I thought that that was actually my opportunity to, to see, you know, if, if, if that was something inside of me that needed to come out, you know, and, and along the lines of, you know, being a drag queen and being a performer, you know, you've got the, the a huge gray area of being um, a transvestite or a cross-dresser, which is a man who dresses up in women's clothing, um, and then transsexuals and... Um, transgender people. And there are some people who really don't know. Yeah. And, and, and there's, there's somewhere in between. And there's, yeah, there's, and there's every different level in between being a cross-dresser and a transgender individual. So I think that's why a lot of the confusion comes up with people in the public just not knowing a lot or not knowing mm -hmm. enough. So a lot of times, you know, being transgender gets mixed with being a cross-dresser and, mm -hmm. you know, you're it's a big you're category. Gay. Right, yeah, because a cross-dresser technically usually considers himself gay because they still like men, they like being a man, but they like dressing up as women just to perform or, you know, for fun. Um, so a lot of, you know, and I've, I've, I've been asked many times, you know, are, so does that mean you're, are you gay? And I don't think, you know, I don't consider myself gay, but it opens up, it just, it kind of just opens up the, um, the topic of conversation for all this gray area that can get very exhausting. And there's a lot of different levels, but I don't think that we shouldn't talk about it. Um, because you know every person is different, you know, and it's it's really it really should be as a person identifies himself is what they are, you know, because gender, sexual sexual orientation are completely different, completely different things. Talk about that because I don't understand that. Um, their gender and sexual orientation are different, um, and I think it gets mixed up because your your gender is often called your birth sex or your sex, okay. Right? Um, meaning what you, the physical, um, f physically what you have. Mm -hmm. um, and sexual orientation is whether you are homosexual and you like the same, you know, being a male who, um, who likes other men or a female who likes other women. Um, but gender identity is, is, has nothing to do with sex. 
Um, I see what it you has mean. nothing to do with sexual lust. It has nothing to do with the taboo of, you know, a man having a sex with what most people will call a tranny, which I find very offensive because, um, you know, I'll joke around with my other sisters about, you know, um, I, <laughs> I've started calling my, when I get, you know, when I talk to my sisters about, um, and referring to myself, I just, I like to keep things light. And so sometimes I'll refer to myself as trendy because um, <laughs> I'm Andy and I'm transsexual. <laughs> um, you know, I've, even my family has had to learn a lot about, you know, I'm not, I don't consider myself gay. I consider myself a woman who was born a male because I'm not attracted to other gay men. I thought I was when I was trying to live as a gay male. Um, but I see myself with a straight man. I see myself having a real family, living as a woman, you know, being completely that female role in, in, in society. Um, and yet you've chosen not to have surgery. You're doing hormones, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What, yeah. What's the, is there a, a longer term plan? It's, there's a longer term plan. And I, the first steps are to do, um, to get onto your um, hormone uh, replacement therapy because it takes time, you know, and you have to equal it to a girl going through puberty for the first time. So as you're, as, as you're building a business, you're mm -hmm. going through this transition and that affects even what your name is. <laughs> you could have kept your name. Mm -hmm. What yeah. made you decide not to? As um, it's the Andy South brand right. and your name is? My name is Aria Pon, um, Ari for short. And my mom renamed me, I asked her to, because it was very important for me to remain connected with my family and to remain connected with my mom. And throughout the initial steps of my transition, I just was wanted to be very sensitive to the fact that I wanted my mom to be as much a part of my life as she wants to be. Every mother wants to be a part of their child's life. Why did she choose that name? Does it mean something? She, in um, yeah. Arya Pond means, um, has a meaning in Sanskrit, which is a, a Buddhist language that she went to the temple to ask for um, two names, one of them being Arya Pond. And the, the meaning of it, um, depending on the spelling, either means um, the blessing of radiant light or the power of radiant light. Which definition did you pick? I picked the, the meaning. The meaning that she would have spelt it was the blessing of radiant light. Um, and the, the spelling that I chose translates um, Aria Pond to the power of radiating light. Power. <laughs> exactly. And uh, so this, you know, it's a personal brand. So mm -hmm. you have to make that distinction between this is me and this is me. So you're, you're essen essentially your, your transgenderism becomes a conversation in your business. Yeah. It's the first thing out there if right. you're the, if you're right. the spokesperson. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It does. The true test was... I had done this after we had started working with Neiman Marcus, which is um, really great for our brand, um, being associated with a high-end retailer like that. Um, now, was that a factor for them, the fact that you chosen to go transgender? No. It, um, you know, I actually met with them about my second collection that they were um, purchasing, and I had gone as female. And at the time, I was wearing a wig, and you know, I was dressing in women's clothing. But of course, in the beginning, I was very androgynous and maybe a little bit more uh, detectable as not being a you know, genetic female. And I, I conducted the first part of the meeting with just them, just their buyer and me, that's it. Um, and then midway through, we got to catch up a little bit more and then I told them, you know, and I said also, I mean, I'm sure you guys know this by now with me coming here, that I am now living my life as a woman and I've chosen to transition and to act upon what makes me happy and you know I just wanted to make sure that the lines of communication were open. The main thing that I told them was you know if you have any questions or concerns or anything about what I'm going through ask me. Like don't feel that you can't ask me because we're professional. Um, we have a professional relationship. I want you folks to be open with me and I want you to know that me doing this is not going to affect my business, but this is my personal, my personal journey that I'm deciding to, to take. Um, what was the reaction? They, they were supportive, you know, and uh, along my journey, along with everybody, everybody was supportive because, you know, it goes back to what my mom first told me when I came out, come out to her as gay. It, it makes so much sense because when you allow your professionalism, when you allow your character to speak before you do, um, there's no denying that you're one that 
should be respected. You know, I think that was the main thing. That was my mom's main concern with me living the life that I choose to live. What a groundbreaking conversation you had with Neiman Marcus. I, mean, I bet you they've never, uh, uh, how, how often do those conversations take place? Um, probably not often because you don't hear a lot about um, transgender business owners or transgender um, women who are, you know, in the process of making that transition as they conduct business. Yeah, Usually I, it's before A lot after. of people would handle it mm -hmm. a lot differently than you mm -hmm. did because yeah. you chose to yep. just say, here's the deal. Yep. And I, I decided that because, you know, quite honestly, I just, I knew that I wasn't happy internally. And my, um, I guess what I always value above everything else is that I'm living a life that I feel fulfilled um, and that I feel happy. Um, because if I'm not happy with the life that I'm living, there's no way that I can do good for other people. A Riyapong Suthi Pong currently operates her clothing line, still branded Andy South, out of her workshop in Honolulu's Chinatown. In a future episode of Long Story Short, we'll talk more with Ari about her life as a transgendered woman. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho! For audio and written transcripts of this program and all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. I love fashion very much, but it's not the only thing that I love. What I love most is actually creating opportunity, seeing something um, good being done for the world, thinking that I'm going to leave the world a better place than it was is why I live every day. And I'm given the opportunity by having a company, by forming my company, by having the drive that I have, having the courage that I have to do it, make the choices that I've made, and to continue living my life as well as living my life in a good way, you know, and um, creating a lot of great things for the community and for society, and specifically with creating jobs, creating opportunity for young talent that's coming out of Hawaii.